Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Zoe Clark and to Howard Edelson, uh, Michigan Thank Radio, political uh, Good analyst, morning. consultant, uh, guru all around. Quick, uh, quickly, Thank I want to say. The <laughs> <laughs> That's the title now, guru. Yeah, guru, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he's got shirts with that. Uh, I want to start right quickly by saying a couple of things. One is there are some historical norms that we know about midterm elections. Yes. For uh, party in power, the president selected that first midterm election can be pretty tough for congressional races, so Republicans have that. Yes. We also have a very unsettled electorate, and anybody who tells you they know with specificity what's going to happen in this election cycle Amen. is either a fool <laughs> or a liar. So we're, what we're going to do is give you as good a guess as we can, and we're going to go exactly to those races. I'm going to skip all the way past uh, the 6th District. Quickly, 7th District, Tim Wahlberg has historically uh, had quite a bit of pressure on that seat, but he has prevailed. Uh, what do we expect? Right, so it's always been that thing in that 7th about kind of money, right? And so as you're looking at the other congressional races, seeing where folks actually want to pool resources, and Wahlberg has always kind of been a little under the radar when it comes to that, but I think this is going to have to do with what kind of wave election, if there is a wave election, but we're not making predictions. <laughs> um, but if there is, you would you would need to see a, a big majority for him to lose that seat, uh, more so than, let's say, a, a bishop in the eighth or, or something like that. And this is a rematch. Gretchen right. Driscoll is, re, is. Uh, is a rematch, and uh, she didn't do very well last time, but th there were uh, macro impacts on that race. I think it's going to be a close race, as Zoe said. Is there going to be a wave, and is it going to help her? And uh, at congressional level races, you really do need organization, boots on the ground, hitting doors, and it, it, that'll be part of the difference, too. Mike Bishop in the 8th District. That's one that you and I talked about earlier. Yeah, this is one. Uh, this is an important seat. This is uh, an open. Uh, this is not an open seat. This is um, in part for majority. Uh, a great candidate, Alyssa Slotkin, uh, who is raising a lot of money, a lot of organization. Uh, year of the woman, potential wave. I think this is a flippable seat, and Republicans are worried about this one. Those those are two potentials if they develop. But Bishop has. Still got pretty good name ID and uh, has an organization. He does, but watch this overall narrative of how Alyssa Slotkin is running as a Democrat. And we saw that with Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania, right? So sort of, I don't want to say establishment Democrats because she hasn't run or been in office, um, uh, but 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 sort of hawkish Democrats, right? And also whether or not she's talking about she would vote for Nancy Pelosi for Speaker. And that's been something, too. Same with the Connor Lamb. Where are Democrats coming down with that? So that's that kind of bigger macro level. Yep, and Trump is going to be uh, a factor. He, this is going to be a nationalized race. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, off-year elections, the party uh, out of power tends to pick up seats. This is one of those seats. Trump will be a factor mm -hmm. uh, in this race. And in Oakland County, there's a changing suburban Democratic independent vote that's starting to trend Democrat. So yeah. th all the, all the uh, factors are in Alyssa Slotkin's favor. Yeah. Will we agree that the Trump factor will be different depending district to district? I mean, there are some places where it's going to play much bigger, some places where it may be kind of a non-issue. Oh, absolutely. So I mean, look at the open. first up yeah. north. Oh, yeah, right. sure, sure. And uh, But again, this goes back to the making predictions about the, the Trump factor that all of us have been sort of scratching our head now for, you know, almost two years about how does that narrative play. It will be very different than, I think, in the primaries, as we've been talking about this right. morning. So if there's a, a Republican primary and they're in Republican primary voters, uh, President Trump has an 80, 90 percent approval rating. They want his endorsement. So you get his endorsement, then all of a sudden, what happens in the general election in these marginal seats? Yeah. It's going to be a uh, factor. And in case people forgot, Donald Trump did endorse Bill Shooty. I just oh, want to put that out there. I heard that yeah. mentioned. Uh, he ninth six district. Times. First of our uh, open seats, uh, what will be the old Sander Levin seat? What do we think? Yeah, so that's going to be another one. I mean, I think we all we all can say safe Dem, uh, right? Yeah. But but open seat and part of this narrative. And, and looking at Michigan con congressional delegation in a whole and sort of the lost uh, amount of institutional knowledge that this is one more seat. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, the dean of the House, the former Dean Dingle uh, and, and all of this institutional knowledge and this is one more name and, and one sort of sort of lion of the house that that's uh, that we're saying goodbye to. What do you, and you, have, you have two good top quality candidates on the Democratic side uh, Congressman Levin's son Andy Levin and Ellen Cogen Lipton 
Both are very good candidates. They're raising money. They're working hard. And watch uh, the money in that race. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I'd give this one to uh, uh, Andy Levin. I think the Levin name in that district uh, is uh, a brand that can't be beat. One of the races I'm the most interested in is in the 11th. That's where uh, Dave Trott is stepping down. What one of many Republicans, uh, um, incumbent 40, Republicans, 40 to be stepping yeah. down. Yeah. And he was a little early to the game. He, he was. Um, he absolutely was. And, and early to the game as a Republican, I remember um, it actually made waves, right, when he tweeted something about the president needing to tweet less and, and work more or something like that. One of the first Republicans to kind of, you know, uh, uh, be part of that. So what does that race look like post-primary? So this is a, uh, a marginal Republican seat. This is an open seat. This is a flippable seat. If uh, Democrats want to gain control of the Congress, this is an important seat, and I think it's also been targeted nationally. So you have three Republican candidates uh, all working hard. One, Lena Epstein, who's outraised everybody over a million plus dollars. I think she'll win the primary. And then on the Democratic side, you have three good candidates. Again, you have uh, Sunil Gupta, you have uh, Haley Stevens, and then you have Tim Grimal. All uh, bring strengths to the ticket. That's that's a toss-up on the Democratic side, and it'll be who has the money and who has boots on the ground turning their voters out. Absolutely, and that's another one um, that I would sort of say is within that sort of same region as the 8th, right? That if Democrats are going to take back the House, they would love, love, love that seat. But we'll see what actually happens. In I want to come back to yeah. that if time permits, because I want to move on to the sure. 13th, and that may be the one uh, that's got more people uh, <laughs> running in it than uh, I've seen in a primary in a long yeah. time, yeah. and some people who may not be running. In it, uh, depending on what the courts decide. Right. Howard, let me start with you. Uh, where do we go with this 13th, again, safe Democratic seat? Uh, safe Democratic seat. I think you have, a, um, as you said, the cast of Ben Hur uh, is running. Uh, <laughs> but you have probably four candidates that, you know, because of money and endorsements, uh, really rise to the top. You have Ian Conyers, state legislator, similar name to Congressman. Conyers, a uh, relative nephew, uh, he's putting together a credible campaign. Brenda Jones, city council member, she's been endorsed by Mayor Duggan, Duggan, an important endorsement. And the Duggan machine doesn't like to lose. So the question, and will, will he turn his machine out for uh, Brenda Jones? And then you have two other, uh, Bill Wild, mayor of Westland, and Rashida Tlaib, former legislator. So, yeah, this one's a toss-up, and it's really, is the Duggan machine going to turn out? And a lot of talk about whether could we see, actually, for the first time, a, a congressional candidate or, you know, a member of Congress who doesn't actually live in the city of, of Detroit representing, you know, much of Detroit in Congress. I think part of his strategy is that you have uh, all but him living in the city, mm -hmm. and can all those people divide up the vote, yep. and then the mayor of Westland uh, sneak up the middle. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about resource, what uh -huh. you were talking about a minute ago. Sure. And I want to do it particularly as we uh, look at the 8th, maybe not so much the 7th, uh -huh. but the 8th and the 11th, uh -huh. because those are two districts that you identify that if Democrats want to take over the House of Representatives, those are the kind of places they have to flip. Uh -huh. uh, so what kind of resource relative to other races or other states do we think they're going to put in here? Because this is a big race in Michigan, because we've got so much on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But all 435 members are up, and so there's pressure everywhere. Sure. So uh, there is a limited amount of money. So are these the races that they're the kind of races they're going to target? Oh, absolutely. Right. I, I think particularly the, the Alyssa Slotkin seat, because what we have seen nationally so far in so many special elections is that she is the kind of candidate that is that is winning these seats or has been able to. So absolutely. I, I think the eighth more so than the 11th at this point for, for Democratic money. But I'd love to, Howard. What yeah, I agree with that. I think they're going to be very expensive races. They're going to be uh, when you have the candidate money and the independent expenditure money, probably anywhere five million plus because uh, you have to buy Detroit TV and that's not cheap and radio for our radio friends. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this overall and you look, and again, I don't, I mean, I know what we all may think. We may think that this paradigm is how this is gonna play out. But after 2016, I have understand now that what I know is that I don't know. <laughs> so uh, when we, we look at what could happen, uh, give me an idea of what the makeup of Congress looks like in January. 
Yes, Howard, give us the makeup of Congress come January. <laughs> and, and numbers, well, and too. Have me yes. back if you, call, if you can call me a liar or a fool, right? Um, I, I think at, at, at worst case, it's a narrow margin. Best case, the Democrats get majority. And there are other factors that are beyond all of our controls. That's why it's hard to make predictions. The economy, how is that working? Uh, is this blue tide, is it going to hit at the right time or is it going to fade? Um, what is Donald Trump going to do um, with, with trade wars? And, you know, is he going to manufacture a crisis to, you know, bring back his base? I mean, there's so many uh, variables that are beyond our control. Hard to predict, but best case, they take control. Worst case, uh, it's a narrower majority, which is good because then Democrats and Republicans are going to have to work together because if you don't have a supermajority, you have to reach out across the aisle. Right. And in all of this, we haven't even yet talked about the Senate seat, well, right? And, and, yeah. and uh, Well, I guess I just <laughs> gave you the Ford promote of that. There we then. go. You did. No, that's, but so what about that Senate seat? I mean, well, we, so we've, we've got, you know, incumbent uh, Debbie Stabenow, who's just proved over, over you know, the past decade and a half that she, she is the candidate uh, who, who just keeps going. She's got a, a large war chest um, and has really been, I mean, has been unbeatable as a Senate candidate here in Michigan. And that is because she is a campaigner, right? Um, and, and knows how to do this thing. And she's a good senator. She delivers for the state. She's on ag committee and important committees for the state. So she produces for the state. She does good constituent services. She's back there. She works hard. And that's why the Republicans have a hard time uh, recruiting candidates. And uh, it's and so I think Debbie Stabenow is on her way to re-election. She's not going to take it for granted. She's working hard, raising a lot of money. But and, and dirty little secret, Republicans are sort of okay with that as a candidate, with, with, with uh, Debbie Stabenow. I mean, obviously, if they got their wish, they would put in a Republican. But you, what you see, again, with the resources conversation, you're debating where you're going to put your money. And you know what? They, they, I think, think, you know what, there are bigger races that, that would have more of an effect on us than trying to take out this well, sitting. Well, part, part of that has to do with the ability of a candidate to bring money to the table, too. And, I and, mean, a candidate, candidate has to show the ability mm -hmm. to be a good fundraiser mm -hmm. before you get the attention of the senatorial mm -hmm. committee or uh, the, the NRCC because they're not going to put their money in until you right. put yours in, right? Exactly right. I mean, to sell your candidacy, you have to be viable. So what does that mean? You have to have a good narrative. You have to be able to raise money and have the right people around you. And she has all of the above. And if on the flip side, you see that the other candidate is so strong, well, you're going to take your resources and spend, spend them in another state or another congressional district because yeah. there is, believe it or not, only limited dollars and at the end of the game at the end of the day you have to allocate those resources and it's a chess game but it is interesting to watch the Republican uh, primary right now two candidates we thought there were going to be a lot more and there was a lot of talk about who was who was going to you know be in that primary now we've got John James we've got Sandy Pensler so it's going to be it, we'll watch that one and see what kind of spending well, look at Lena Epstein I think she was running for the US Senate realized it was a lot of headwind and then had an epiphany well why don't I go run and uh, for Congress in the 11th indeed Indeed, and we had the former uh, Supreme Court justice as well, Bob Young, who then uh, dropped out. So right. now it's now it's down to two. So when you get done with all of this, we are almost out of time. Uh, you think that at least over in the House, things will be very close, if not a change in majority. Uh, the Senate is already so close. Uh, what happens there? When I'm sorry, the, the so the House and then what was the, the Senate? The Senate. The what do the pickups look like or losses? Oh, uh, the Senate. The Senate um, I think the Senate gets more narrow as well. It could be hard for it to get much more narrow. Uh, agreed, agreed. And, and again, but to, to absolutely go back to what Howard said, it is uh, now the beginning of June, and we have months and months. And what we know, as we have all seen, is yeah. anything can happen. And this pendulum, as you were saying earlier, the off year, yeah. people out of the White House, the pendulum swings back. It's how far. Yeah. yeah. And we'll find out in a few we months. We will find out.